keeping the disrupt stage uh, all day today, but focus is on you two. So I'd love for you two to uh, introduce yourselves. Adam, you start. Oh, yeah. So Adam Brown, um, currently leading the digital technology platform for procurement at Maersk. So means I'm responsible for a whole team of people uh, building and integrating and deploying uh, technology to solve and support all the issues and problems and processes that exist within both the procurement function, but also all the way across the source to pay process. And then prior to that, a very similar thing at uh, BT as well. Great. Cool. My name is Patrick Folk. I look after all of enabling and insights capabilities at Roche, at Global Procurement at Roche. And I also lead the function strategy and transformation from a tech perspective as well as from an operating model perspective. And the funny thing is, I yeah, shared with you before, please. Adam and I met four years ago on a, a very similar uh, sort of, I guess, uh, offline at the time uh, webinar about a very similar topic. So um, hopefully we can share some of this with you here and uh, some new thoughts. Absolutely. And we've got a Slido for your questions. That QR code should be popping up uh, in just a moment. You can submit your questions through the app, uh, and we'll get to them in just a moment. Uh, so first off, tell me a little bit about the topic today. I don't know anything about digital procurement, so where, where do we even begin? How do we have a successful digital process and transformation? That's, that's not too far off, being the first question that was asked four years ago when we, we were last together and last did the same thing. My memory fades. Well, what was your answer back then? That's <laughs> 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 a real test now. <laughs> the, so I think um, for me the most important thing is that I can, can either make this a success or kill it completely is, is mindset. Right? If, you, if you're not willing to take any risk, if you approach it the same way as you bring a big uh, clunky technology into your enterprise, Right, then you're not going to deliver success. And also, another great example for me is if you approach digital or technology purely from a, I want to make it better, but not from, I want to make it differently and through different better, yeah? I think you're not going to be that successful. So mindset and better versus different, I believe that's how I started, but yeah. I don't know whether it's true. Oh, look, for, for me, it's uh, the... The people, that, that's the, the absolute critical element with all of this. If you want to make it successful, you have to uh, get the hearts and the minds and you have to get the people using it. It's, um, it, I think the thing that I keep coming back to is that no matter how good the tech is that we deploy and how wonderful we think it is, you can't be in some kind of digital ghost town, sat there all on your own, surrounded by the most glorious technology, be that things that we've you know, um, seen, I think, are, are, are wonderful. Yeah. The people have to use it. They have to truly use it, truly get the benefit from it. And it uh, needs to be led from above. So I don't know if we've got any, have we got any CPOs in the audience? Anybody? Any CPOs in the any house? Any CPOs? No. No notorious <clears throat> CPOs? So we have the people no. who are actually using the stuff. Well, in that case, you need to be pressuring your leaders, your CPOs particularly, to use it themselves. Whatever tech is deployed, they have to be using it. There's no get-out-of-jail-free card if you're going to change you know, hearts and minds and transform a procurement organization. Very true. If I can build this very quickly. Sure. It's a great topic. And I think um, even seven, ten years ago in procurement, we were deploying technology for procurement's sake. We felt a, a commodity code spend is something that everyone should care about. But actually, no one does except for us. But our technology and the way we build technology, the way we make the business use or used to use technology was all around procurement, very procurement centric. But that has changed, I think. We're now taking the lens of the business. So how do we make, or how do we build technology that they love it or like it, and through that theme, then start to use us and adopt? I think that's critical. The next, I think, phase of that journey for me is the supplier lens. I think we are treating our suppliers still too much as, we pay you money, so you do whatever I like. Yeah, but I think that whole perspective needs to change too. We need our suppliers to like our technology as well, and I think that brings success ultimately in adoption. Uh, it comes back to that, uh, that famous quote, there was the American general, didn't he? he said, um, strategic narcissism, and I think in, in procurement and in corporates, and certainly in the, the big ones, we're very, very guilty of that, 
of this almost strategic narcissism and always looking at everything from our perspective and our point of view and say, yeah, here's, here's a system, go and register on that and use it and not actually ever getting yourself in their shoes, trying to use it yourselves. We need that, uh, a much, we need to go with uh, strategic empathy, exactly as you're saying. Look at it from their perspective, make it work for your... Um, suppliers, but <clears throat> the bit that sorry, I don't know if there's any questions. I'm just going to carry. We're making the dialogue. <clears throat> I'm we just going to carry on chatting chat with Patrick. I mean, I've got questions coming in, but you uh, uh, keep but, going. But the thing that I'm fascinated in, which I think you you guys did amazingly at Roche, was the whole operating model bit as well, and how the two completely linked together. Very true. So, uh, at the risk of making it a dialogue here, um, <laughs> I just continue. Um, I, I truly believe in you cannot bring tech on your own, on its own. If you just bring tech, I think there's a risk of failure very quickly because it's not aligned to processes, the way people work, the, peop the way people want to use technology. So the way we have approached this, we did this in parallel. Obviously, more effort, higher, I guess, investment, bigger change and everything, but we see this becoming a success because technology supports the way we work and the way we are set up. Okay, we're, are you ready for some questions? We're, we're better take some Okay, <laughs> great. He was ready to talk. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one specifically addressed to you, Adam. Oh, uh, God. It says, oh, God, here that? we go. <laughs> uh, digital procurement garage <laughs> is now commonplace. You were the first. Where did the idea come from? Um, I do have to give a bit of, um, well, a bit of credit, a lot of credit to um, Cyril when he joined as uh, CPO at BT. And the... Um, the drive and the change to digitize, and not just you know, digitize in a completely traditional manner, but really put back into the grassroots of um, entrepreneurship, of uh, creation of digital technologies and evolution of digital technologies. And uh, wanting to you know, create an environment that we could um, collaborate with really early stage startups. Um, that you just wouldn't ordinarily be able to do in a big organisation. And uh, the original idea was we would give them floor space as well. We were based in central London and um, had you know, good office space in town. It was, yeah, the idea was they could come and you know, work with us, be on a floor with a hundred and something procurement professionals to talk to. Um, unfortunately, then something happened, which meant we weren't working from offices for about two years. But, uh, but nevertheless, it, that was the, the original intent and the gestation of it, just to really support and work with that grassroots innovation, which you now see here in just, it's just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. But I think if I may yeah. add, um, that comes back to my thinking in terms of you need to do differently to achieve different. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you basically bring digital solutions, startups technology into a big corporate and do it like the way you bring in the EAP program, you're going to fail like without trying. Um, so I think you need to have some sort of capability that's different to IT, that it's close to procurement and close to the end user to actually make that change happen. So whether you branded a garage or whatever, but that capability that Adam described is I think fundamental to success. If you have a startup connect with an IT organization, IT talks about data security, system access, that you kill them right away before they even start it and you kill your idea. So you need something different as a bit of an incubator or something, something where they can slot into. Garage, whatever you call it. This might feed into one of these questions, uh, Patrick. Um, someone asks, enablement and insight is a great place to develop new and better approaches. How do you scale it to the whole organization? Well, that's, that's built into what we do. So when we take stuff in, either from an enabling side or from an sort of insights perspective, it's all built around the process, the way we work, about scaling. Change management is critical. User experience, instead of taking the lens of who is this for? A supplier or the user or even procurement, think this way and start with that exactly. Yeah? Don't think about, oh, I understand the problem, so I now build something without talking to anyone, you will fail. So scaling comes from lens of the user. Yeah. You had started to say something uh, Oh, yeah, I completely forgotten that. Okay. I was, I was more <laughs> no interested in what Patrick was saying. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Uh, uh, previously, you mentioned this phrase, strategic narcissism. Mm -hmm. uh, so someone's just asking you, give us your two cents on that idea. How do, uh, how do you overcome strategic narcissism? <clears throat> oh, it's... it's um, I, 
I think it's more endemic in the really big corporations and um, hits in with a process that we need to employ to ensure that we are adhering to all legislation and, uh, and um, our own internal requirements, as Patrick already said, for data security and, uh, and whatnot. So when... Oh, I think we have an answer from... I have an answer from <laughs> <Yeah>. Siri uh, <laughs> from the front row. Um, and so when we start going through, we've got all of these requirements we need to impress upon suppliers. Well, well guess what? How many companies are there impressing that upon suppliers in their own unique and, uh, and different ways? Ideally, I think as you know, Eloise, who we all know has uh, advocated before, wouldn't it be great if there was just a digital wallet so that it was ubiquitous across the industry that everybody could use? But unfortunately, that doesn't exist. So you know, we need to stop looking at our asks on suppliers from our lens and expecting them to do all of this to register for you know um, 101 different tools yeah their suppliers are going to say no and you need to be able to deal with it and it's also the inefficiencies we generate with this not only for them but also for us <coughs> and esg sustainability is a great great example yeah. if 100 companies in their own way and own form ask the same suppliers, similar suppliers, to submit their emission data. It's going to create a mess and chaos in the industry, which will come back to us, ultimately, as, as the ones who need to process this data and work with these suppliers. Whereas thing they say no, or even say, I'm not going to work with you. So I think we need to have that lens pretty soon. Well, if, if you want to then take it even further and... Um if you're asking the, uh, the supplier to fill out multiple different systems and multiple different ways across you as a, uh, as a corporate, well, the flip side of that is you're inefficient internally because of somebody on the inside of your company looking at all of these different data points with big overlaps and everything else that goes, yeah. goes along with it. So you're internally inefficient. You're hurting your suppliers, particularly if they're small ones. Back to the wanting to work with innovative small suppliers, because where do you get the innovation? Where does that drive from? If you want to work with them, you can't impress all of that complexity. Otherwise, it's not just going to, it just won't work. You'll, you'll kill them, you'll break them. Um, I was talking to the guys at Zip, and this was a fascinating thing. Three years ago, so right back at the beginning of uh, 2020, when they were still kind of slightly in stealth mode. Um, and I really wanted to do something. They said, you know what? We are consciously only working with a fixed number of big corporates each year because we'll just be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's an incredible level of maturity, an incredibly sad state of affairs if that's what we like as big, uh, big companies. So solve for it. Treat the you know, uh, companies with that, a level of empathy. So when hard times come around like we had with COVID, like we had in the UK with uh, Brexit, and you're wanting your suppliers to respond really, really fast, and you're wanting to get your PPE, you're wanting to get your uh, what, whatever is needed, who are the suppliers who are going to be wanting to do that and work with you? Is it going to be the ones who have an incredibly hard time interacting with you, have a hard time getting paid, have a hard time submitting invoices, or is it going to be the ones who have a, a joyous, simple, happy life with you? So it works in your favour. Absolutely. Anything to add on to that? No, I think I see many people okay. typing in questions, hopefully yeah, not okay. text messages. You can, here it comes. you can go old school and just shout, by the way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here we go. Uh, how do you manage your digital product catalog between maverick selection of tools from stakeholders and the crazy amount of solutions mm -hmm. in the market dedicated to niche needs? How do you manage a digital product catalog? Happy to go first. I think the most important thing is, is use case. So we, we are collecting two things, use cases, ideas, problems, and we are, on the other hand, are also building a portfolio of solutions that we scan quickly, we try to start mapping where possible to the use cases, then we prioritize. Um, but I think you should not just go after the thing that looks most sexy or super efficient whatsoever. There needs to be a use case, it needs to be a user journey, and it needs to be value that comes out of it, and uh, then work through the prioritization and the process that we have. Yeah. I think the best, um, the best phrase I had um, that helped me with this years ago was from um, Sam at Mars, and uh, it's something that I've maintained ever since, was with all of the uh, technology that's available, keep you know, a constant list of um, what's there that you want to play with, 
because you think there's something good, we're going to learn from it, there's some, something insightful, it might be relevant, it might be useful. So what do you want, what, what's there that you should you know, uh, play with? So proof of concept, learnings, talking closely with the suppliers, with honesty. I mean, you know, don't lead any suppliers down the garden path ever, because that's just wrong. What's the stuff that's really emerging that you just need to keep an eye on for right now? What's that, you know, the, the, the stuff which is coming in the future? I mean, maybe we're looking at some fairly cutting edge AI technologies at the moment. Um, and then thirdly, what's the stuff which is a no brainer and just deploy it now? Yeah? So segmenting those three ways of everything that's available there on the uh, marketplace is one thing, it ties into what Patrick says, and then a couple of other metrics which I always, um, you know, have. Uh, deployed is, you know, if, if I'm looking at a piece of technology or if an internal, you know, internal customer says, here's a bit of technology, I measure it against, can I do this with Excel and SharePoint? If I can, what's the point of it? To be really blunt, because what actual value add is that technology bringing? It has to be over and above. Second one is, everything has to have a consumer-grade user interface. Otherwise, we're back in the land of um, yeah, tumbleweed and <laughs> ghost towns, which is not nice. Yeah. Back in I think one, one quick yeah. addition to this, which mm -hmm. I think uh, is critical for us at least, you also need to, back to my taking risk uh, sort of mindset idea, is you only learn once you're engaging with, the, for example, a startup or a technology piece, what it could really do. So while use case, user journey, all the stuff I mentioned is absolutely critical, sometimes also valuable to just get going and explore and see what happens. Yeah? And uh, you learn the most from it. We have uh, some of our most closest partner. We started off here, and I think we went there. And where we are going now is, is amazing success. So I think you need to be flexible and take some risk. Yeah, absolutely. Got a question now on um, buy-in and budget. Uh, what are the value leverages and KPIs that you use to ensure buy-in and budget commitment from your sponsors uh, beyond savings? Great question. Yeah. It's also the, the question we got asked last time. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> History repeating itself. Yes. So money, where does it come from? So I think um, buy-in for, for me comes with credibility. Yeah? So you, you cannot do super poorly uh, everywhere else and then say, hey, CFO or whoever gives you money, I have this amazing digital idea. No one is giving you money. So I think you have to have some sort of success that you can prove. I've got my house in order before building some, some crazy other tech out. I think that's, that's critical. Or at least a story. How does it fit into your transformation? How does it fit into your overall digital landscape? You need to have something that you can sell. I think that, that gives you usually permission to play. In terms of the money question, um, be creative. Yeah? So start, for example, with a pilot. And then convince the users that this, or the, the end users ultimately, the business, that this is something super exciting for them. Then co-invest. Other things that we've done um, that helps us to ultimately get over this hurdle of this will cost a few hundred thousand. Just get going with smaller amounts, maybe focus on some elements, and then win the users ultimately, or win the people who fund it by great feedback, yeah. through great feedback. Yeah. Oh, completely. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, we've got a question about IT now. Do you see IT as a service provider or a partner for the success of the digital transformation program? Prime question for you. So I'm IT in this scenario, so we're critical. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I have a slight, slightly flippant response. But no, I, genuinely, um, I'm... Yeah, uh, the, the remit that we have is the technology and the IT to support the procurement function and the source to pay process. So that whole um, you know, uh, ideation, solutioning, budgeting, you know, all of that sits within um, the platform. We partner very closely with um, the, um, the procurement function um, because the, the, the way we're set up is we only do that. We're not a standalone, we're, we're not a, um, an end-to-end -end IT organization that supports the entirety of the company. There's no competition between you know, some, you know, any other part of the company and procurement for my time and resource and my team's time and resource. That is the only thing we do and that's what we're entirely focused on. So, yeah. I think our IT is set up slightly differently and um, I think know how and when and where to use IT. If you can connect like a three people startup with an amazing idea that fits exactly use case with this massive IT machine, it's never going to happen. So I think 
where in the process, how, from an engagement governance perspective, that's what you need to work out to have success with IT. Yeah. Create a digital garage, Patrick. That's the answer. <laughs> that's what you need. <laughs> okay, this one's a little more open-ended, uh, or they're asking for a top five. So what are the top five things for program success, in your opinion? I think that's where we started. Yep. For me, it's mindset, take risk, be creative, creative in a way how to sell it, then connect it, and this is no order, five things. So link it to a use case and lens of the user. Those are the five things. That was easy, I went first. So. Yeah, so, <laughs> does that mean I, get a, I have to think of five different ones? And, no. and that means you're getting 10? This is a bit of a cheeky <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah, should, have, should have said two and a half each. But, um, the, the biggest one, the, the biggest lesson I learned was the power of selling what we did around the company in, my, uh, in the previous work that I did. Um, to get the, that, um, that real success and driving towards credibility on what was being set up as something very, very new at the time. Um, the first um, bit of technology that we uh, deployed, I don't think it's any secret, we deployed um, Supplary to doing all of the spend insights and analytics. There wasn't anything really beyond a spreadsheet that, that pre-existed that. And the very first time I demoed it, the very first person we demoed this to was our CFO. And I demoed it to him on a mobile phone. And so there, with, a, with an iPhone, demoing spend analytics that could tell him at the push of a button, not just you know, what we were spending, cut by any geography dimension that he wanted, but we said, look, you just type in any customer name, and you will instantly know how much spend is being used to support that customer. And that really changed things. And we, we ended up um, with the buy-in from the CFO, from the CEO and the CFO leads of all of the group companies, um, which drove credibility instantly, then all of the, the people in procurement suddenly going into meetings and finding out that, hang on, there's this bit of technology that is being developed and created and deployed for procurement that's being used wider by the business. It really generated that excitement and buzz, but comes back to that commercial grade user experience, user interface. That, that was the number one thing, so sell it around the company. It is all about the users. I mean, of course, I'm just completely glossing over any, it has to fit a use case. You just can't do things randomly. We're not in this for just playing with stuff for no reason. Um, the reason that sits behind it is basic requirement. Yeah. Well, this is another uh, big tent question here, asking about any other big lessons learned and anything you would do differently next time. God, um, that's really yes. big. So yeah, oh dear God, there's so many, so many lessons learned. Yes. Uh, it, it's it's really really where to start. So um, I've already mentioned the big one, which is whatever you uh, whatever you do, sell it around the company. There's um, with uh, what we do in procurement is so critical insight and information is so valid across the entirety of the business. Um, Look at what you're doing. Look at how that can be federated out and used wider across the company because that will just make you more successful. And if you're having problems with adoption within procurement, if the people in procurement are seeing people outside of procurement using the stuff, then it really does help. There's a, that, there's a, there's a level there for the, um, the user adoption. Get it working on a mobile phone. As stupid as that sounds, um, it doesn't have to be a native app. Um, optimized web front ends to this thing. <laughs> see somebody smiling over there, um, works incredibly well. That um, being able to just get to you know, stuff on your mobile phone instantly is the way the world is now. It, it really does work brilliantly well. Um, fail as fast as you possibly can. If you're doing something, if it doesn't feel right, look at it closely, ditch it, pivot, change, whatever. Don't keep you know, pushing and pushing and pushing when it's, it's not working. So fail as fast as you possibly can. Um, I could keep going on, but we've got, it says, less than five Maybe minutes. One, one personal lesson, even if there's something that is super sexy and you really like it, but it just can't get there in terms of either the, the technology functioning, the users liking it, or it's solving really the use case, stop it. I think you have to accept failure and... Uh, just write it off and continue. Because if you drag on and drag on, it <coughs> eats into your credibility. 
That goes further than that. So there's um, yeah, failing fast, but then also where things will go wrong. They will fail, and it will happen at some point in a spectacular way. You take ownership of it, understand it. There is, um, what, what's the phrase, extreme ownership. Yeah? Understand it without any blame game, drill into it, figure out exactly why, what went wrong, what the problems were. Sit with your team move on. and you know, understand it, move on, and for goodness sake, don't do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, so this one's about data. What is the data focus in your companies? How independent from IT are you to develop your own digital products? I would take it further than, than just data. I would talk about content. So you can have the, the most amazing, fastest computer on this planet without software. It's just a piece of plastic. Yeah, and I think that applies to our technology and our systems as well. Without the right content, without the right data, um, you're not getting this anywhere. So I think you need to almost think content data first, what you want to do with this data and content, and then build the technology to an extent around it. My, my best example is we are good in procurement writing the greatest category strategies and the most amazing buying channel strategies and everything. But we often forget, how do we actually get it to the user, so the technology, and what kind of content and data does it need that they can actually understand what we are trying to do here. And I think, therefore, that needs to come first. Think content, think data, and how to use it. Yeah. How you use it, it's a, it's a critical thing. I mean, they, yeah, what's the point? Uh, you can, you know, pile as much data as you want into a data lake, but what's the insight that you're driving from it? What are you actually trying to achieve? So, um, to pivot from being a procurement professional, from running a, a, a category, um, how do you figure out what, what, what is the art of the possible with, with data? What could we do? What is there? What, you know, even if you don't know what questions you should be asking. So, get some knowledge about data science understand it. There's loads and loads of information, there's loads of courses. Just get some basic knowledge to start triggering the grey cells, as they say. Um, Just maybe one quick build on this. Um, because I think in procurement we are data geeks. Yeah, we are hungry. As much as we can get, the better. And, and when I talk to sort of my category managers, sourcing guys, they always talk about how can I push savings the furthest, uh, for example. And they then come back with, like, I need this insight and that market study and this and that. But the effort that they have to put in, the amount of money it costs and time to actually get there, is it worth it? Probably not. So be practical about the data and be efficient and effective. Don't ask for more than you need because the additional 1% of savings for 100 days more input or thousands of dollars for the next market study or data, not worth it. So be practical and efficient when it comes <coughs> to data. I would say be be honest as well. You know the, the the savings are they real? Are they actually really hitting the P and L? Is it just you know made up against the forecast which you're not achieving? So have have yeah you know, if there's yeah you know, anticipated procurement savings based on um, an actual real last year's spend with some you know um, you know adjustments for uh, volume for efficiency for FX for everything else that you can trace down to the P and L golden. If it, be honest, if it's just um, with yourselves, if it's just you know, made up against some forecast which is never going to be hit, or then you know, it's slightly less um, relevant. And the, um, yeah. Great, well with our last minute, any other last words, anything else you want to touch on today? Well, have fun here and fun with digital and technology. Yeah, keep, yeah, look downstairs. I've been around the, um, uh, the exhibition, oh, there's some amazing stuff. There's some really, really good, you know, cutting edge, interesting stuff. I'm particularly fascinated with the various ways that AI is being um, used and leveraged. There's a couple of, um, you know, very, you know, interesting new um, demand intake um, um, additions to some existing technology with the wonders that is ChatGPT. So I've enjoyed looking at that. But yeah, have a look around and just learn and trigger the, trigger the brain on what could be possible and applicable in your company. But applicable is the critical thing, not just something sexy and fun. Make it work. Make tech work. That's it. Oh my gosh. Well, let's give a nice round of applause for Patrick and Adam. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us today.